good. All right, so what we're dealing with today is uh, what is the book of Psalms and where does Jesus fit into it? And I've got a couple of readers planted in the crowd, and I think I have got a couple of, hmm, what did I do with those little cards? Um, but I'll remember your names. Um, your youth pastor actually gave me a few names, Harris and uh, Chris Seiss, am I saying that right? Um, and no, you can't leave because we'll all watch you. Uh, and Melanie or Melody, which one was it? Yeah? M Madeline. Okay, so I'm just warning you, at some point in time you get to read. Um, and it's always good to be forewarned. So what is the book of Psalms? It's so familiar to us, isn't it? It shows up on refrigerator magnets, on cross-stitch, posters in your bedroom door. If you go to the Grand Canyon, it used to be on a plaque. It'll be on the sides of buildings. We all know the book of Psalms, right? But reality is that even though it is so familiar to us, like Claus Vestermann said, a great Old Testament theologian, the book of Psalms really belongs to a world that no longer exists. And so my larger curriculum with this book is going to be to pull you back into the Old Testament world so that you can read and pray and sing the Psalms right along with your ancestors in the faith. But first you got to get the big picture. So what is the big picture? I want you to start thinking about the book of Psalms. Okay, this is going to be funny too because some of my Hebrew fonts are not going to show up and you're just going to going to have to forgive me. Okay. So the book of Psalms, I want you to think about it as a hymn book, okay? Hymn book of ancient Israel. How many of us know what a hymn book is? Okay, you do, you do. Even after the age of PowerPoint, you at least know what one is. So when you think about your hymn book, uh, shout it out for me. What sorts of things do you find in a hymn book? And I want to hear you. Songs, I heard songs. Give me another one. Creeds are in our hymnals. Responsive readings, are they in your hymnals? Communion liturgy, is that in your hymnal? Okay, baptism liturgy. If you guys are using the United Methodist uh, hymn book, then you have, quote, 962 pages of hymns, canticles, and other acts of worship. If we have any Anglicans or Episcopalians among us, we're also dealing with collects uh, and uh, morning devotionals. In other words, what a hymn book is, is it's a collection. It's a collection of everything that the congregation of faith, the community of faith, needs when it gets together to worship. And you know what else? It's organized. You know that? In fact, if you open up the table of contents, you will see that there are hymns to be sung and fill in the blank. Hymns to be sung at Christmas. So, for example, if someone asked you to sing the song, Up From the Grave He Arose, on Christmas Eve, you would think, well, that pastor has no idea what they're doing, yeah. Or if they asked you to sing A Little Town of Bethlehem on Easter morning, same response, uh, excuse me, Pastor Ryan, what are you doing? That's a mess. Yeah, that's what you would think. Because we intuitively approach our hymn books and we know what they do and what they're for. Well, what I'm telling you is your book of Psalms is a hymn book. And it has everything in it that you would expect to find in your hymn book. And it has a table of contents. Bet you didn't know that. And that table of contents reflects that we've got five books five chapters, let's put it that way, uh, within your hymn book. And each one of them is actually announced. So I've got somebody out there who's been um, assigned Psalm 41, verse 13. Find your passage because I'm about to call on you. Um, look, book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. Five books. Does that remind you of anything in your Bible? The Pentateuch, perhaps? Penta means five. Okay. So you get five books in the Pentateuch. You get five books in the book of Psalms. This is on purpose. Because by the time they got to Chris Tomlin's essential collection, they cut out all the ones that didn't make it. By the time they took the sixth 
thousand hymns that Charles Wesley wrote. Did you know he wrote that many? And the three tunes that he wrote to go with all 6,000. Have you noticed? Um, they had purged the collection down to the essential five books. So book one is Psalms 1 through 41, and it ends with a doxology to let you know that you're at the end of book one. So Psalm 41, verse 13, shout it out for us. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Woo! Let's hear it. Okay. That is a doxology. And that lets us know that we're done with book one. Now, I don't know the name of whoever read that, but as you're looking at your Bible, Morgan, Morgan can you look right below what you just read and tell us what you see? Right below, directly below. Book two? It says book two. Yeah. yeah. And you think that the NIV translation committee put that in, don't you? Well, as I now sit on the NIV translation committee, flex. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you we didn't put that in. That's actually part of the original book. So Morgan, the ancient writers are letting you know you have passed out of collection one and you are now passing in to collection two. So who out there has got 72 verses 18 through 19? All right. Tigger is making his way over. Okay. Read for us, if you will. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Amen. This guy makes me want to shout. Yes. Give him a cheer. Come on, youth group. Cheer for your people. These are your people. He's a confirmand, y'all. Confirmand, I'm just saying. Confirmand. And pastor, what is his name? Stratton St McCann. All right, Stratton, right below what you just read, immediately below, what do you see? Book three. Book three. And once again, the translation committee didn't put that in there. It was in there from the, the first days of recording the book of Psalms. So what you see on this chart in front of you is you see the table of contents. Book one, two, three, four, and five intentionally structured around the Torah. Each one of the collections ends with a doxology. And of course, when you get to the very end of the book, it's Psalm 150, right? Which is praise the Lord with cymbal and harp and lyre. Praise the Lord with loud shouting. Praise the Lord with big cymbals, little cymbals, guitars, lyres. Whatever you can think of, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. In other words, the conclusion of this book, Psalm 150, is the biggest doxology anybody has ever seen. So there is structure to your collection. But keep in mind that just like Hillsong, or Passion International, or if you come from the Gaither generation. These are the selected final proofs. These are not every psalm or hymn that's ever been written. In fact, your Bible has a whole bunch more psalms in it, like, oh, I don't know, Exodus 15, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. On top of that, the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that David wrote 4,200 psalms, and obviously not all of those get made it into the collection, but these have been distilled down to offer the believer, the congregant, the general worshiper, everything they need when they gather together to be able to worship God as a community. And glory to God that we've been offered that because you and I both know that there is nothing more uplifting, more exciting than walking through those doors and hearing your music coming out of these speakers, you know? And if you're 16, your music is going to involve a lot of percussion, and it's going to kind of be shaking the walls, and you're going to come trucking on in. If you're from my generation, you might want the volume a little further down, and if you're from the generation ahead of me, you might only want to hear the organ making the walls shake. But Whichever music it is, what it does is it unites the people of God. It gives them a voice. And what power emerges from that moment when the people of God gather together to rehearse the mighty acts of God and the fact that we all go together with all of our warts and our messes and our mistakes, we go together. So this is your book. 
Now, you will notice as well that in that book, cut across your big slide and coming down on your small slide, that the first psalm is a Torah psalm. Blessed is one who doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers or stand in the way of sinners, but blessed is the one who keeps the law of the Lord. So the first psalm is a lens setter. It's a lens setter. Like in my world, if my husband wants a cheerful wife, the cup of extremely strong black tea with a perfect amount of whole milk and sugar will arrive on my nightstand before my eyes open. This is the lens setter. If that tea does not arrive before my eyes open, it's not going to be a good day. Just letting you know. In 20 some odd years, and we're pushing 30 at this point in time, um, yeah, he's learned. So the lens setter is the Torah psalm. And what it announces to all of us is that we plant our feet on the covenant that we've made with the Almighty. This is who we are. This is our past. This is our platform. This is our faith. And don't step into this book without it. Because if you step in with that lens, you're going you're gonna to be flying blind. The second psalm, very interesting, is a messianic psalm. Whoops, I did that wrong. Second one, messianic psalm. This is because the psalmists in their collection are letting you know your past is the Torah, the law of God, the covenant you've made, the yes, O confirmation class that you have said. This is your past, your foundation, your future. It's Messiah. Your future, what's going to give you the strength and the hope and the power to live out this Christian life is keeping your focus set on the new Jerusalem, the new creation, the Eden to come, and the fact that Messiah is coming. The rider on the white horse will not forget us. That's Psalm 2. Okay, so those are the lenses before you step into the collection, remembering that it is an organized collection, but it's, it's been cherry-picked from every era of their history and every place of their experience. And then you need to know that the two leading collections within your hymn book, the book of Psalms, are songs and recitations of lament and of praise. What is a lament? Well, we're going to look at one very closely tonight. A lament is a cry of distress. A lament is, God, where the heck are you? A lament is loud. It has strong language. It's angry. It's bitter. It's, hey, I made a promise. You made a promise. Show up. And let me tell you all uh, second, third generation believers, your God can totally handle that. You do not need to be polite when you pray. You need to call out to the Almighty and let him answer you because you're not the first person to stand in a dark space and say, God, where the heck are you? Okay, lament is the number one category in the book of Psalms. Did you guys know that? There are more laments, both community laments and individual laments in the book of Psalms than there are any other types or genres of song or recitation in the book. The next group is going to be hymns, which are songs of praise. But someone in here who has, has earned their white hair, tell us why lament is the number one leading category in your book of songs. Shout it out for me. Did you just say life is hard? Yes, she did. Um, I just want you to know that that's exactly what I would have said. And um, so perfect. It's almost like I gave you a cue card. Life is hard. Life is stinking hard. Bad things happen. People you love die. Babies are born with deformities. Businesses collapse. Global pandemics happen. Graduations are missed. Boyfriends cheat spouses walk, pets die, bad stuff happens, and yet we turn to God 
and he answers. This is Lament. Okay, so this is your book. This is its organization. And this book, if you happen to know the handy dandy timeline from your Epic of Eden studies, this book and these hymns and laments and creeds and liturgies and communal moments will control Israel's experience all the way from Exodus chapter 15, when they cross the Red Sea, as you look at this slide above you, down to the United Monarchy when David will at last take the tabernacle and all the psalms he's been collecting and move them to the collect capital city where the temple will be built. But it's going to keep controlling the worship of the people of God all the way through the divided monarchy and all the way to the point where Israel actually collapses in exile. The book will go into exile with them. And when they come back, under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Now, I really need the youth group to say that name with me because it's just one of those names. But, I mean, you shouldn't even name your guinea pig this, is what I'm thinking. So, Zerubbabel? Just one more time to entertain me. Zerubbabel. Okay. He's the guy who brings all the Jews back from the exile. They will rebuild the temple, and they, this hymn book will continue to function. Okay, so how are you supposed to deal with this book as you interpret it? Well, I'm teaching you a new word. For those of you who've been doing the studies, it's not new. It's the word hermeneutics. Once again, you have to say it back to me. Hermeneutics. One more time, hermeneutics. This is a 75-cent word. If you ever get in an argument over the Bible, just use it, and your opponent will walk away. Okay, what it means is the science of interpreting the Bible. And believe it or not, there actually is a science to interpreting the Bible. Everyone in the world thinks that they can interpret the Bible. Well, uh, no. There actually is, are things to be learned to properly step into interpreting the Bible. And so when you're interpreting the book of Psalms, and as I will teach you when you get the larger curriculum, you need to realize that this book has been historically influenced. These are real people. Real people who are studying, uh, uh, worshiping in real time. And in that real time, they are living in the midst of a religion that sacrifices animals. So when was the last time you brought a goat to a worship service? Raise your hand. No, a, a real goat, not the stuffed goat. A, did we bring a goat? I am so impressed. And did you ask Pastor Haley to dispatch it for you? No. Did you roast it over the big bonfire with the s'mores? Heck no. Although, I think Ryan would really like to do that. <laughs> Just, it's, it's in there. Okay, so of course not. That's not how we worship, but that is how they worship. And so we're going to have to learn something about that. The other thing is that this is a nation where church and state are absolutely blended. So at any moment in time, you could see the commander-in-chief dancing down Main Street because the Ark of the Covenant is coming into the temple. Okay, I don't think the Republicans or the Democrats would be very comfortable with that. Yeah? But this is how they lived. So when you hear about enemies of the kingdom of God and you hear about someone who wants to succeed in warfare and he trains my hands for war and he strengthens my arms so I can draw a bow of bronze, no, they're actually talking about warfare because in their world, God ruled from Jerusalem. And so the kingdom of Israel actually was the kingdom of God. And anyone who is an enemy of Israel in the ancient world was an enemy of God. Now, can I please just tell you that that is not the new covenant, that is the old covenant. And America is not the kingdom of God. And no matter who sits in the White House, they will never be his theocratic officer. But you're going to have to enter into that world to understand the book of Psalms. Okay, the other things you need to realize is the book of Psalms is the only book in your Bible where you can just let that Bible fall open and go, that applies to me. Please do not do that with the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. Please do not do that with the Gospels. But you can do it with the book of Psalms. It was written for that. It was written so that I could say, oh, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Right now, right here, in my particular space and time. So it was indeed designed to be applied to the general believer. It's universal, which is fabulous. 
The other thing you need to realize when you step into the book of Psalms, it is a human response to divine action. So the human response is going to be very experiential, not necessarily pedagogical. Let me say that another way. You are not reading a theology book. You are reading a worshiper's response to the mighty acts of God. And so you need to be a little light-handed with the theology that you're reading. So when the psalmist says, God vindicate me, throw their babies off of the mountains so that they fall upon the rocks, that is not a command for you to go and do likewise. <laughs> that is a moment of profound grief and the worshiper is expressing their experience. As a result, there's gonna be a lot of emotion in this book. Emotion that you're allowed to copy. Last thing you need to remember that this is poetry, and in the words of Larry the Cucumber, it had to rhyme. So there are gonna be places where the poet is more interested in making sure it is beautiful than necessarily practicing clean didactics as in an instruction manual. Okay, all of these things are important and the last thing I want you to know about reading the Psalms as we're gonna jump into Psalm 22, that's where we're headed, is there is a hermeneutical principle. Okay, remind me what hermeneutics means. The science of interpreting scripture. Okay, you've got it. There is a method, a method I want you to learn right now, right here. And I like to call it the bucket handle approach. So if you take care of horses, if you are a heavy duty gardener, you are regularly grabbing the handle of a bucket and what's in it is heavy, right? A bucket full of water and you're gonna haul it down to the barn and you're gonna fill up the watering trough or whatever it is. The bucket handle approach to reading the book of Psalms through the lens of the New Testament. Your New Testament writers are going to quote the book of Psalms, ready for it, more than any other book in the Old Testament. Even more than Isaiah, even though a lot of people say it's Isaiah. More than any other book in the New Testament. But the way they're going to do it is they're going to grab the bucket handle. They're going to grab a little piece of a psalm. And they're going to have this outrageous expectation that their audience knows what else is in the bucket. They're going to assume that if they pull one phrase, you, the reader, actually know what's in the rest of the psalm. And they're going to do this so that you, like listening to a really good sermon, will pull all of that back content forward as you study the book of Psalms. Okay, so if I had all night with you, which I wish I did, but you probably don't, okay, um, I would talk you through the Jesus and the Psalms whole lesson. And I would focus in on two Psalms. I'm only gonna have time to focus in on one. And I would point out to you that Psalm two, oh, that's that second Psalm in the collection, isn't it? Oh, that's the lens setter, isn't it? That's the one that tells us as the people of God that we've gotta be looking for Messiah. That Psalm two is used to mark the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Yeah, and Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. It's a royal psalm. It's, it is a psalm that they used every day, not every day, but every coronation day in the temple to announce and celebrate as a congregation that the man standing on the platform dressed as a royal with a horn of oil being poured over his head was the chosen king of Israel. So Psalm 2 at the beginning of Jesus' ministry is being used to communicate loud and clear in your New Testament that Jesus is indeed the coming Messiah. Take a look at this psalm. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized. You've heard this recently. But John the Baptist tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Why do you come to be baptized by me? This is the bucket handle approach in use. And so Matthew 3 goes on. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this thing to fulfill all righteousness. So John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized and went up from the water, look at the yellow print, at that moment, 
heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. Okay, so in the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, the New Testament writer is grabbing the bucket handle. He's grabbing Psalm 2, and if I had all the time in the world with you, we would walk through Psalm 2, and you would see how Yahweh is announcing his human Davidic king and saying to all the people, this is the guy, follow him. So when this voice from heaven recites Psalm 2, or just this little tiny piece of it, Every Jew standing in the crowd does this. Whoa. I want to do that again because it was fun, because I like the microphone. All right. Whoa. Okay, because all of them know that they know that they know this is the one. This is the one. And of all of the preachers standing on every street corner during the first century of Roman occupation and the oppression that is breaking the back of the Jews, and the teacher of righteousness down in the Essene community who's busy copying the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this guy who's preaching here and that guy who's preaching here, this is the one. This is the one. Okay, so that's Psalm 2, the beginning of his ministry. But with the time I have with you this evening, I want to focus on Psalm 22. How am I doing on time here? I've got till 10 after 7? Yeah? Haley says yes. I think I could say 20, and she might say yes. No? No? Okay. All right. All right. So we're going to take a look at Psalm 22. If you've got a Bible with you, open up Psalm 22, especially Harris and Melody and anyone else I can remember, because we've got stuff to read. Okay. So Psalm 22 is a lament. This is the moment when we cry out to God, life is hard. Psalm 22 is an individual lament. So it's one man standing there saying, I have done everything I am supposed to do, and yet God is nowhere to be found. Remember that laments have strong language, and folks, your God can handle it. Remember that one of the greatest outcry here is vindicate me, and remember that there are more laments in your Bible than anything else. So again, taking a look at our little outline, which I can make sure is available to you if you want it, more laments than anything else. Okay, what is the layout of a lament? Layout of a lament, this is an actual literary form, so it has form. The first section will be an address of praise. God, you are God, and you are mighty. The next will be a complaint of distress. Life sucks right now. Horrible things are happening to me. Things I can't tell my friends, let alone my youth pastor. Things that are crushing me. I, I'm up at two in the morning throwing up in the toilet and nobody knows. I am so addicted to the stuff that's coming across my internet screen and I am so ashamed. My parents are doing things that if anyone knew, this is a lament. This is the cry of distress. Then there's a protest of innocence. And these psalmists are bold. I have served you. I have been faithful to you. I have declared your name. Where the heck are you? Then there will be the petition for deliverance, and then there will be the concluding vow of praise. Always the concluding vow of praise. So these psalmists never end at the bottom of the pit. They always end with their face looking upward, their hands stretched upward, find me, save me, pull me out of this mess. So Psalm 22, an individual lament, a Davidic lament, and can I say as well, it is more than likely the script that Mark, the gospel writer, uses to record the passion of the Christ. How interesting. Okay, there's an image up on the screen, and I had, did not know the story of your community when I put this image up on the screen. Um, you are looking at the Vietnam War Memorial up on the screen, and you're looking at a vet uh, dressed in camo on the day of dedication. And um, I was actually there on the day of dedication. I was a wet behind the years youth pastor, and we had brought our youth groups all around the Washington area to hear Mike Warnke preach. And he was going to stand on the Lincoln Memorial steps, and the place was packed out. And I'm 
the child of a vet. So I have very high empathy um, for this particular scenario. And I, was, I got caught in a tidal wave that day, um, a tidal wave I will never forget. When we arrived, our whole goal was to be good youth pastors, to make sure our kids heard the gospel, um, to be a part of this historic moment. And we wanted them to hear Warnke, who himself was a vet. And as we're there during the day, more and more and more people are coming. And the people who are coming, they're in wheelchairs. They're in crutches. They're in camo. They've still got their dog tags. They've got the dog tags of their buddies. There are injuries and burns and, and defects figurements everywhere in the crowd. And every one of these guys, when they stepped into this monument, you could just feel the sacred space, the hush that just would fall over them. And they would walk up to the wall, and they would touch the wall. And they were all looking for the name of a friend. That's what they were looking for. And these grown men, at this point, 45, 50 years old, would just start sobbing like children. And it was a day. It was a day. We got all the way through the preaching, all the way through the moments with our kids, and I thought I was going to survive this day without totally losing it. And there was a parade at the end, and if you come from the Washington area, there is a bridge that leads over to the Arlington Cemetery, where all the vets are buried. My dad's buried there. And um, they had brought out all of the military academies. So uh, uh, West Point was there, and Annapolis was there, and the Air Force cadets were there, and they were all beautifully dressed in their fresh, crisp uniforms, and they had trained and trained and trained, and they're 18, 19, 20-year-old young men in the perfection of their manhood. And they are marching in perfect cadence, and it's beautiful, right? And the crowd is cheering, and it's a lovely day. We get to the end of this parade, and spontaneously, all of the vets in the crowd start falling into the parade behind. And their friends are pushing them on wheelchairs, and they're coming in on their crutches. And they're, a lot of them are addicts at this point in time, and their hair is ragged, and their bodies are ragged. And if you, you, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know that they came home and they were rejected by the very nation that they served. You, you don't know. We know. And they fell into line, and they start marching behind all of these cadets. And the crowd went wild. And it was so beautiful. It was such a moment of healing, because that crowd cheered and clapped until they were hoarse. And, and those, those men were finally allowed to be welcomed and celebrated by their country as they crossed the bridge. It was a beautiful moment. And Ryan told me right before I came up on this stage, that the extra granite from this monument is right here. Did you not? I'm, yeah, a moment. Okay, this is what a lament is supposed to do. A lament is supposed to bring healing. So here we are. We're going to look at Psalm 22, and this is good hermeneutics. When you look at a psalm, the first thing you want to do is you have to put it back in its original context before you pull it into its next context. So its original context, know that we don't know exactly who wrote it. It is a psalm of David, but did David write it, or was it dedicated to him? I'm not exactly sure. But it's associated with King David, perhaps while he was in exile, running from Saul, perhaps when the burdens of leadership are so heavy upon his shoulders. Okay, so Harris, does he have the mic at this point in time? Are we ready? Will you, will you read this first paragraph for us? And we need some passion here, dude. Go. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry day by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. Yes, this is the cry of the distress. Have you heard those words before? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you see the bucket handle? This is what Jesus is pulling, okay? And he's just pulling the handle, but he expects you to know what's in the bucket. Okay, let's keep going. Do we have Melody next? Yeah, perhaps? Allie, okay. Right here. And don't forget, I need, I need passion. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the 
praises of Israel, and you out, fathers, put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They've cried to you and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not disappointed. All right, so in this expression of trust, right, the psalmist who is in agony is, is, is declaring, even in my agony, I, I know who you are. I don't see who you are right now, but I know who you are, and I know that my fathers trusted in you. And so as I talk to you 14-year-olds, in that moment of agony, I can't see you, but I know that my parents, I know that my pastor, I know that my grandparents trusted in you and, and you delivered them. Are you here for me? So now we're going to turn to lament. Who do I call on next, Haley? Okay. But I am a worm, worm and not a man, <laughs> scared, sorry. Squirmed, I'm so sorry. But they can't see the print. I'm sorry. Keep people. going. You got it. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord secure him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. So let's pause and think of David for a moment. David, who had been a rock star from the Goliath moment forward, all of a sudden is in exile the king is hunting him. Everyone says, oh, yeah, dude, you, you were going to run the country, and now you're absolutely nobody. They have taken your wife. They've taken your position. You're living in exile. you got six dirty guys living with you on the edges of nowhere. I am a worm and not a man. And guys, again, especially youth, I, you have been in this place where something has happened and you have walked out on the field to try out and you totally blew it. And the coach said, not you. And that long, slow walk to the locker room. Everyone who sees me mocks me. Or that horrible moment in the cafeteria where you trip and everything on your tray just goes everywhere, shaking their heads. Or everyone knows, everyone knows what my dad did. Everyone knows, and I have to show up with his shame on my shoulders. Okay, we're making this real tonight. We're making this real. So the lament comes, and now the prayer of confidence. Haley, who's next? Should it be Pastor Ryan, do you think? Yes, she does. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast, don't giggle. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. And do, so, well, I'm sorry, I forgot. Do Go. not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there's no one to help. If you have not stood in this space yet, you're just not old enough, because it's coming. It's coming. And so we turn the page, and now, Pastor Ryan, do you think it's Pastor Haley's turn? I do. <laughs> Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircled me, roaring lions that tear their prey, open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has, hurt, has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a, what does it say? Potsherd. <laughs> I, I will take you excavating, and you will know more about potsherds than you ever wanted to know. I it's a promise. That. Okay, go. <laughs> and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay in the dust of the death. Yes. Okay, so strong bulls of Bashan. First of all, does this sound familiar to you? Yeah. As you remember the passion narrative that was read to you six times this past week, are any of these words repeated? Of course they're repeated. I am poured out like water. The man was pulled in for a kangaroo trial at 10 o'clock at night. He was beaten and tortured all night. Do you think anyone offered him a liter of water to rehydrate? 
My, it's poured out within me. My heart has turned to wax. It's melted in me. My strength is gone. Have you ever been there where it's so dried up you can't even move? You, my tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth. You lay me down in dust like the dead. Guys, the New Testament scholars are convinced that Mark is using this psalm because Jesus pulled the bucket handle. And so the gospel writer is pulling the whole psalm into the gospel. Bulls, they might not sound scary to you, but in reality, they are one of the strongest and most potentially dangerous land animals in the land of Canaan. Bashan is a high plateau where you you grow cattle. That's what you do. Lions are real, and everybody knew the danger. These are the sorts of things he's reciting. So now I think it's time for Pastor Brendan because I'm running out of kids here. Go team. Dogs surround me. (laughs) A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my, stop it, Ryan. All my (laughs) bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast my, cast lots for my garments. He covered my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard there's a dog story, actually. Um, <laughs> and I want you to know I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, okay, you have heard these words before. This is what the psalmist is reciting. And then the psalmist turns his final words, and this is indeed an, a, a, a wild dog. These would not have been nice, tame, fluffy white dogs. These would be wild dogs um, that uh, are, are, are quite dangerous. So the final vow to praise is, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. All the ends of the earth, hang on to that one, will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to Yahweh, to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. I'm totally running out of time here, so let me remind us, and I'll just uh, cherry pick, that the passion of Mark 15 strikes on all of these moments. The chief priests, the elders, the teachers in the Sanhedrin are the ones that pull him in to their to the kangaroo trial. These are the strong bulls of Bashan. What shall I do then with the one you call king of the Jews? Pontius Pilate asks them. Crucify him, they shout. If you're Harry Potter people, you know that the Latin for crucify, how does the spell grow? Cruci... Cru- Do it for me. Thank you. It means to torture. This man is being tortured. Uh, Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate tries to give him away. He has him flogged and beaten, thinking that the wrath will be quieted, but the wrath won't be quieted. And so the whole company of soldiers, look at verse 17. They put a purple robe on him then twisted together a crown of thorns, jammed it on his head, and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck his head. Okay, concussions? Again and again they're beating this man. They're torturing this man. They spit on him. They mock him. They strip him naked in front of a room of people who are mocking his physical appearance and his vulnerability. They fall down on their knees and they make fun of him. And they lead him out to be crucified. Guys, this is all coming out of Psalm 22. And as we move forward, they brought Jesus Jesus to the place called Golgotha, and they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. Are you recognizing the script? It was nine in the morning when they crucified him, and the written notice of the charges against him read, the king of the Jews. How incredibly ironic. He's been crucified for exactly what he is. He's being tortured, alienated, marginalized, humiliated for being exactly who he is, the very hope 
of Israel, the hope of the Psalter, the hope of the people of God. They're trying to silence him and to quench the light, right? And those passing by were hurling abuse. Can I remind you that when people are crucified, they're not set up real high like we have in all the artwork. Jesus was probably about 18 inches off the ground. So the people who are coming by can come right up to him, and they can spit on him, and they can touch him, and they can mock him in his nakedness on the side of a highway. They're wagging their heads and saying, ha, you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself and come on down from that cross. In the same way the chief priests, these are the seminary professors, also along with the scribes, these are the district officials and the bishops, were mocking him among themselves and saying, ha, he saved others, but he can't save himself. We've won. Even those being crucified with him are heaping insults on him. You know, if I was dying a torturous death on a cross, I don't think I would waste my last energy mocking the guy next to me. But that's what they're doing. And then at three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out. And what does he cry out in a loud voice? It's the first line of Psalm 22. Yeah? Yeah? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lamak sabachthani. Now, I do Hebrew. This is Aramaic. This is Aramaic. Hmm. Now, let's think about Jesus for a moment. He's a rabbi, right? He's trained, very well trained. Do you think he memorized his scripture in King James, New American Standard, or NIV? Go ahead. What do you think? I'm going to go for Hebrew. How about you? Yeah? So if he's memorized Psalm 22 in Hebrew, why is he crying out in Aramaic? Because he's not just crying out for himself. He's not crying out his memory verse to strengthen himself. He is crying out in what is known as the lingua franca. He's crying out in the language that the people standing at the foot of the cross would understand. Because Jesus wants to make sure that everyone in that crowd knows exactly what's happening. That the heir of David's throne is crying out with the lament of David. And he is crying out so that the prophecies and the mission of the Messiah could be seen and could be fulfilled. So with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You know what that means. It means the presence of the Almighty is at last available to the common man, and not just the common man, but the outsider gets to come in. And when the centurion, the centurion is a Roman, the centurion thinks all this Jewish stuff is stupid. The centurion can't figure out why there's so much infighting and why this guy has to die. And you know what? He couldn't care less. He wants to get home and eat dinner. The centurion doesn't speak Hebrew. But the centurion speaks Aramaic. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, and he didn't know Psalm 22, and he heard this cry, and he saw how Jesus died. The centurion, the pagan, surely this man was the son of God. Jesus cries out in Aramaic because he wants to be understood. Jesus cries out in Aramaic because the divine prophecy coming out of Psalm 2 was that the nations would be the inheritance of the Messiah. And this centurion is a citizen of the nations. And the thief on the cross is the first convert, and the centurion guard is the second. I want you to hear that. I want you to understand that. I want you to know that it's coming out of your book of Psalms and to force you, entice you, lure you, bribe you to get you into the book of Psalms. What I want you to realize is that Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the heir to the throne, the firstborn from the dead, the one who could have called a legion of angels at any moment in time, dies with the words of the psalmist on his lips. 
Jesus allows the ancients to pray for him at his most agonizing moment. And they do. <laughs> they do. If Jesus can find strength in that moment from the Psalms, what can we find? And so what I want to say to you, and I'm over time and they're about to pull me off here, is this. Athanasius in the fourth century has a beautiful quote. He's a church father, an old dead guy. Think of the dead poet society. Okay. The Psalms have a unique place in the Bible. Whereas most of Scripture speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. And when you're in that dark night of the soul, when you're in agony, when you're unsure that nobody sees you, when the secrets of your world are crashing in and crushing your life, when it's three in the morning and you're sitting in the ICU and all you can hear is the whir of the machines and all hope is evaporating, let me encourage you, my brother and sister, that the Psalms pray for us. And you can open up this book any day, any time, and let the ancients pray for you. Jesus died with the words of the psalmist on his lips. Was his choice of Psalm 22, a psalm from David's collection, another nod to the fact that he was the son of David, the rightful heir to the throne? Yeah, it was. Was it also perhaps his identification in his most public moment with all of us who have known betrayal, abandonment, humiliation, dehumanization, injustice, collusion, lynching, and rape? Yes, it was. The Jesus of the gospel in the throes of his own despair models to us how not to simply endure our suffering in this life that is very hard. He models to us how to overcome it, how to triumph over it. And in this blackest of night, our elder brother, the firstborn from the dead, prays. And he calls out to a God that he knows will answer because he has answered a thousand times before. So let me leave you with this. The God that you're crying out to, he's been cried out to thousands of times. Has he shown up every time? You can bet your life on it. And you can find the prayers of the ancients in your book of Psalms. So thank you so much. It's been lovely to be with you this evening.